Hello and welcome back to GI Live Online. I'm James Batchelor, Editor-in-Chief of GamesIndustry.biz, and for this session we're going to be taking a look at one of the heavyweights of British games development. This company was first founded in 2003 by a team of four, but has since grown to more than 700 people, with offices in Nottingham, Newcastle, Leamington Spa, Warrington, a satellite studio in India, and its headquarters in Sheffield. It's known for games such as Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, and its sequels, uh, Little Big Planet 3, Snake Pass, Crackdown 3, and Sackboy, A Big Adventure. Many of these games have won various awards, including two BAFTAs this year for Sackboy. That was a, a, a week ago at time of recording. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why I'm being so mysterious from the build-up, because you can see from the session description uh, that I am, of course, talking about Sumo Digital. And joining me today is CEO Carl Cavers. Carl, thank you so much for joining me. Hi, James. Good, good to see you. How's life, uh, how's life up north? It's, uh, it's, it's very good, actually. Pe more people should do it. <laughs> more people should do it. Well, I, I, Move north. <laughs> there has been this thing, like, are, are, now that we're all remote working because of the last year end of the circumstances, like, are people going to move away from London or only to find that actually they're called back to the office? Or are they going to find uh, jobs elsewhere? If they want to move to God's country in Yorkshire, particularly Sheffield, we'll, you know, we'll more than happily find them something to do. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. The um, objective of this uh, session is just kind of go through a little bit of um, Sumo, its history, the big kind of milestones you've been through, and uh, and how indie de developers can learn from this. Perhaps can you know one day one day reach these stages itself. So to kind of start off with, um, I mentioned obviously that this was a team uh, formed by a team of four. I believe you were one of the original founders. How did Sumo come to be? Oh, that that's uh, oh, I could talk for an hour on that. It, Sumo came to be from the basically the ashes of infograms uh, back if i go back to the 90s the four founders we'd worked together at gremlin i was running gremlin development uh, james north hearn was there as the development director um paul porter was the cto or or or, or the, the head of core tech at that point in time and darren mills was an artist we got acquired by uh, infograms off market in 99 i went on to run their their european development divisions plus australia which always seemed to get tagged on to to the european operations james was running publishing and you know what we had a great time at infograms and and working with bruno in the team it was it was a really good three years but unfortunately things didn't work out there and an infogram started to 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 need to cut costs. And, and during that time, I had to lay off quite a lot of people across the European development divisions. Never a very nice time. But out of that, I negotiated with, with Bruno and Infogram to take all the tools and technology that we've been working internally on the development and, uh, and start Sumo. You know, we had great relationships. James and I had great relationships with Sony, Nintendo, and Microsoft. We were able to take all the development systems we needed. So what looked like a day one startup, although it only had 12 people with four founders, we were really were accelerated. We've got years and years of worth of investment in tech. We've got some great relationships already in, in the space. And in, in fact, the key question for us when we started Sumo was whether to be a games publisher or a developer. Having worked in games publishing to that point in time or worked in the publishing environment, we felt there was a missed opportunity. A lot of game developers back then and publishers treated the relationship as, as very much an iron curtain between game development and publishing. And we wanted to break that down. We wanted to be completely transparent with how we worked. We wanted to, to ensure that we had a partnership style relationship. And, and that's, you know, that's ultimately what drove us to decide to be a video game developer rather than a publisher back in 2003. Nice. So uh, what, what sort of games did you, you start working on? Um, what were your kind of earliest titles? And then I you know, assume it's been going for so long. Like how have the, the type of games you developed kind of evolved from those first titles? The, the first title I worked on in the games industry was, uh, was Actual Soccer and Loaded, you know, <laughs> back, back in the day um, as, as we were developing those at Gremlin. At Sumo, the, the first thing we actually got commissioned for was, was a piece of uh, software for an exercise bike called Trickster, where we <laughs> made a full 3D environment where you could basically operate the bike through the terrain. It would give you power outputs. not too dissimilar to how Zwift is today, to be honest. 
But we also, within three months of starting Sumo, started to work with Microsoft. And what a lot of people don't know is the England international football game, we did the full multiplayer solution for that. Microsoft approached us. Codemasters were running out of time. They had to get the game out uh, for the, for the uh, European uh, Championship. And Microsoft wanted them to put multiplayer in because at the time EA weren't putting multiplayer into, into the, the game because they wanted to own the multiplayer experience. There was a bit of, I, a, 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 I guess, a bit of posturing between EA and Microsoft back in, in 2003 and 2004. So we helped them get that away. And that's because we had experience of doing actual soccer. You know, actual soccer was the first game online with 22 players we could all play online that were fully motion captured so it was it was an easy decision for microsoft it was an easy decision for us and off the back of that and doing that networked um, demonstration with with eif then that's really what gave us the breakthrough with sega and uh, i remember to this day getting a phone call from matt woodley who i'm sure a lot of people listening to this and watching will remember Matt rang me up and, and asked me to go to Sega to talk about a game with big red cars and, and at the time I was like well you've released 355 challenge I, I, don't, I don't really know what it's going to be about but of course we'll come and see you and that's how we started life with Outrun and, and Outrun is really what got Sumo very quickly into into the public eye you know Outrun's a a great game from an arcade perspective. We took that, we faithfully kept Outrun to be the type of experience that people had in, in the arcade, but made it work on console where you weren't putting your pound in after every you know, three or four minutes, but it still seemed seamless. And, uh, and that started a long-term partnership with Sega. And you know, we've worked with Sega virtually consistently ever since. And um, you know, we, a, a lot to thank Mr. Sarumi-san for there. The partnerships that Sumo's um, managed to, to get over the years and maintain, you've already, already mentioned like, you know, Sega and Microsoft. And so, yeah, you've done the, the Sonic and Sega All-Stars games, so both the tennis and the racing games. You've yeah. done, um, you've helped contribute towards things like Forza Horizon. Um, yeah. I, I'm trying to remember. Others, I'm sure you can list more. Like, but the, we, made, we made the Microsoft Xbox Fitness game. We then did Night Plus Connect Fitness. Uh, we did the launch title for Xbox Fitness on on, on the X Xbox One. So yeah, we, we we've actually been working with with Sega since two thousand and three, um, well, Microsoft since two thousand and three, Sega since two thousand and four, and Sony since two thousand and five. So really long term term relationships. So I guess what I was building to was like how those relationships evolved because it, it's gone from co-development and kind of working with them on projects to taking the lead on, you know, like you were one of the major developers of Crackdown 3. Looking at the Sony relationship, you obviously developed Little Big Planet 3, which was, I believe, yeah. the first title in the series that wasn't developed by Media Molecule, the studio that created yeah. it. And then you've gone on to do the BAFTA-winning Sackboy, which was entirely, entirely sumo. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we really did start doing whole games. You know, we've done some co-development along the way. Um, certainly with England International Football, with, with Microsoft and Cody's, that, that was, you know, a co-dev. But certainly with, with Outrun, that wasn't a co-dev. We, we basically took the, the arcade source code. It was never supposed to fit on an Xbox. Reimagine the game and faithfully reproduce everything for the Xbox at the time. So we did, we did the whole game and, and even then working with, with Microsoft very early on Xbox Fitness, again, we, we did the whole game, we conceived the idea. I remember sitting in, in, a, in, in Redmond with Dave McCarthy, I think it was in two, back end of 2007 or early 2008, where we, we talked passionately about using game technology for fitness. And Dave had been responsible for, for EA uh, sports active at the time before he joined Microsoft and and we just saw an opportunity particularly with a Kinect camera that we, you know, we could really do something that that could mean people could exercise in the living room and I, and I think that was a great experience so we did all that that then led on to to the uh, Xbox fitness launch with with the Xbox one 
from lots of other things in between. As you say, we started working with, with, with Sony in 2004, but we, we really started to work with Media Molecule at the back end of 2009 properly. And, and again, our, it's funny how phone calls really stick with you, but getting a phone call from Pete Smith at Sony saying, look, you know, Media Molecule are going to be focusing on doing another game. He didn't tell me what it was at the time. Um, and we really need, you know, somebody to, to step in and take on responsibility for the game. And, and we worked with Media Molecule really closely for a few years to make sure we took the spirit of what that franchise meant to Sony and meant to Media Molecule. And we fully developed LBP3, which we were really happy with. You know, a great, great first experience in terms of a game launch and conceiving that whole idea and the whole experience with Sony. And then continuing to continuing that work on through Sackboy, and then doing other things at the time, you know, through that period like Crackdown. Again, Dave Jones coming to see us in I think it was 2012 originally, and Dave and I had had a relationship from when Gremlin bought DMA back in 90. When did we buy him? 96. Um, and uh, DMA were part of the Gremlin family back then. And we'd always respected each other and, and Dave respected our ability to develop. He got a great idea for, for Crackdown 3 and together we partnered and presented that opportunity to Microsoft. And we were the main video game developer. Dave was, you know, Dave was the main creative behind that. And we love collaborating. You know, we do take on responsibility for doing whole game development from the idea right the way through to final delivery. But we, but we believe that collaboration gives you something extra. And, and working with the right people and, 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 and talented and creative, passionate people is, is the right thing to do. We'll dive in a little bit uh, into collaboration in, in a minute. What I kind of wanted to ask from, from all this, like, you know, looking at the different partnerships you've got with these big high profile companies and their high profile brands is how can a studio like earn the trust to be, I mean, you're, you're, you're trusted with Sackboy, which in some ways is the closest Sony's got to a mascot in some ways. Yeah. Um, like, you know, Sony's always kind of lacked that kind of Mario figure and Sackboy is it, you're trusted with Sackboy, you're trusted with, um, you know, the long way return of crackdown. Like how, do, and obviously you had these previous relationships, but beyond that, like how does, how can any studio kind of earn the trust to be trusted, to, to be given the, the freedom to kind of experiment and, and work on these big, big brands? I think, I think there's several things. There's one is, is putting a lot of effort into the working relationship. You know, it's not, it's not about a, a commercial relationship at that point. It's about the working relationship and how you can work together to realize a better game at the end of the day. And, and, and we value input from our partners as much as they value our input in to try and make, the game as the best that it possibly can be uh, and and I think just having we're quite humble in what we do you know we don't try and and take over from the publisher in terms of the ownership of, of, of the game or the IP we you know we, we stay in the shadows you know it, it they're responsible it's the, it's their game it, it's their IP but we're responsible for giving them quality and we always, you know, we've got a saying at Sumo, which we've carried on from the Gremlin days, which is we're only as good as the last game we make. So we put everything into ensuring that that, that game is the best it possibly can be by the time it comes out. And, and I think if you'll start to build a, a good, solid reputation if you deliver what you set out to deliver. Ideally exceed it, you know, be cautious about what you promise, but at the same time, make sure that you absolutely deliver what you said you were going to deliver. Nice. Um, so let's go look at um, collaboration again. Uh, because as you say, like the, the, the vast majority of Sumo's um, history has been collaboration um, and working with these big partners. But you have also kind of dabbled in new IP. We've seen things like Snake Pass and Spider. Um, yeah. I guess for you, like where's... Where's the balance? Like, how, how does the balance, how has, how has the balance changed over the years? I ask that because um, at the risk of oversimplifying what you do is like work for hire. Most work for hire studios I have spoken to um, over the course of my career, they are, they're doing work for hire with the ultimate goal of becoming, of reaching the point where they can do their own IP, where they can focus entirely yeah. on their own IP. I get the sense 
what with your BAFTA winning third party games and so forth, that that's not a priority for, for Sumo. Is that, is that fair to say? It's very fair to say. Why would we not want to work on some of the world's best IP? You know, and, and in Sumo, you know, you, you, you've seen what we've released, but there's also a ton of stuff that's confidential that we can't talk about. We, you know, we talk in, in the market presentation at the moment, we've got 40 projects with 28 different clients at the moment within Sumo Group. I think I can talk about seven different projects out of that, that 40. You know, we, we are tremendously passionate about working with great IP because, it, it, you know, it, it's a, it attracts great talent. It creates a, a really um, positive and creative atmosphere as well. That atmosphere is one of the reasons we started to create some of the smaller games ourselves and come up with some, some of our own IP. Because working on a big game now takes years. And sometimes people just want to be able to have a creative outlet and get a game done in, in 18 months or two years, which you know, going back 10 years was a long time, but in the, this day and age is, is not that long. So doing something like Snake Pass because we, one of the things we do regularly is run game jams. And, and Snake Pass became an outlet for, for a game jam, which, which was great. You know, a unique game mechanic. The team came together. They, they've made a really polished, small game. It's given us a great commercial return. But ultimately, it wasn't about that. It was about having a creative outlet for our teams so that we're not just having to think of great creative ideas for existing IP or franchises that we're working on, we can let go a little bit and, and be a bit more free with, with the thought process and creative process. And that's what resulted in, in, in Snake Pass. It, it's how Little Orpheus came about. Obviously working with Dan in the Chinese room has been a great experience. Um, at Spider, you know, again, that was inspired by Snake Pass because <laughs> Who'd have thought we'd have had a spider as a secret agent? So having that that ability to just be a little bit more off the wall in terms of being creative, that's the reason that that we you know we're we're also working on our own IP. But proportionally, we're only we're, we're only doing the same as we've ever done really. You know, we're we're not doing a lot more or a lot less, and it, and it will ebb and flow depending on how much client IP we're working on at any one time. Let's dive a little bit into the um, the kind of the business milestones of Sumo. There's um, there's been a lot of big moments for you guys, uh, particularly in the last ten years. But there's two I kind of want to focus on a bit more. Um, first was the management buyout in 2014. Um, mm -hmm. Now, can you tell us a little bit more about like for those who may not have been reading the news at the time, like what this was, how it came about, what impact it's had on Sumo today. So the management buyout was a, a culmination of us buying our own business back. You know, as you pointed out at the top of this, we started the business in 2003, but we actually sold the business in 2007 to, to Foundation Nine Entertainment. And a lot of people that were in the industry back in 2008 and nine will remember just how difficult a time it was not just in the video game space, but, but generally in the world due to the collapse of some of the banks, the financial markets were, were, were very difficult. It, it meant that, you know, Foundation 9 struggled in some ways in the US. At Sumo, we've always done well. And, and Sumo was lent on at, during that time to help support some of the US operations, which was fine. But we got to a point in probably late 2012 where we felt that our ambition as a, as a studio and a business and as founders wasn't being realized because we were too busy supporting other operations within the, the, the group at that point in time. So we started to discuss a management buyout. We, we drove that process uh, and we managed to buy the business back in 2014 with the backing of a, a private equity firm called North Edge Capital, who were tremendously supportive considering they'd never done a video game investment before. Nice. Um, well, on this note then, like, because we've got a mix of developers watching today, like any advice for, if anyone's in a kind of a similar position as to you were, as you were back in that, back at that time, 
any kind of advice on on how to approach that, how to handle it, things they need to be aware of, like if they if they want to kind of grasp for that independence. Take great advice. You know, find the people that can give you the right advice. Without a doubt, you know, we we, we had the right advisors on board to help us through that process and ensure that we had a, a balanced outcome. We wouldn't have achieved that on our own if we didn't get the right advisors. And so I'd, I'd always stress somebody that's going through a process of investment or, or looking to grow their business in a way that, that attracts investment, then they, they should be taking some independent external advice. And there's a lot of good advisors out there now. Now, there's been a lot of activity in our space over the last decade, which means there's a lot of knowledge from advisors. Um, so I'd encourage anybody to, to speak to advisors, find an advisor they think is offering the right advice and, 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 you, and listen to them. Just as big, if not bigger. And um, three years after the buyout, Sumo Group went public. Uh, we had an initial public offering that valued the company, at, I believe at the time it was £145 million. Pounds. Yeah. Um, why go this way? Like, I, I mean, we will talk more about IPOs in a second because we've seen a number of them over the years, particularly in the UK. But why was that the right course for the studio? How does, how does an IPO benefit a company like, uh, a company like Sumo? So it, it benefits a company like Sumo because when you take on private equity support, it comes with an element of debt, mostly. Debt is repayable. So that starts to slow down. As, as you become larger, the debt technically becomes larger, potentially, yeah. And that can slow down your strategic ambition. So we had a plan. We, we knew we would take on debt, which is fine. We could service the debt. But various covenants with banks, quite traditional, monthly, quarterly, don't always fit in with cash conversion within a video game space. And certainly in terms of understanding how video game developer works as opposed to a publisher, etc. So it, it can be a little bit limiting when you look at your strategic ambition. And, and we could give that cash back to the bank because we've got debt. Or we could spend that cash in a better way to help accelerate our strategy. Coming to the market allowed us to pay off the debt, very importantly. And that's one of the reasons you've seen Sumo accelerating growth. So when, when we did the management buyout in 2014, we had 236 people. When we floated at the end of 17, we had 489 people. In just over three years, we've gone from 489, and, and the number you quoted at the top of this at 750 odd, was actually the closing figure at the end of 2019. Today, we, you know, we are 1,043 people wow. and growing. And we wouldn't have been able to do that had we got a level of debt because we wouldn't be able to reinvest in the business in terms of capex, locations, acquisitions. So losing the debt has been, been a great freedom for the business. You know, that does come with a trade-off. I, I present to the city every six months. I'm currently in the middle of a road show now. And our results went out on Wednesday. They they you know very well received, which is which is great. You've got to deliver what you promise. But we're, we've always been in that environment, so we treat the city like a like a, a normal project. You know, we we commit to a partner. We say this is what we're going to do, and that's exactly what we deliver. Right. Um, as I said, like we've we've seen a lot of IPOs over the last few years. Like Sumo's kind of held up as as one of the examples, but you've got Frontier, Team Seventeen. There's kind of a number of big UK companies have um, games companies have, have, have floated in the last few years, and then even the last year, I'm, I'm losing track of like the, the number of games IPOs I'm writing about. Um, you know, Playticker, Unity. I, 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 there's there's oh, loads. Oh, Tiny Build went recently. Tiny Build. Oh, Masters went, and now they're, they've been they're private. <laughs> well, the the trade now again with with EA. So yeah, yeah. it's it's I'm, I'm losing track of like how many how many games companies are public. Like it yeah. feels like there's been a real yeah. shift in the industry. They've kind of been. Um, a lot of talks about as to as to why that's happening. I kind of I'll, I'll pick your other thoughts. Like why why are we seeing more IPOs? Why are why are investors or investors and shareholders like becoming more confident in in the in backing these big games firms? I, I think there's several reasons, but but for me there are two key reasons. First one is the fact that 
video game market is no longer cyclical. Having digital distributions made a massive impact on the, the predictability and regularity of sales. Whereas if you go back 15, 20 years when there were other businesses on the market, and there was a bit of, if you remember at the late 90s, early 2000s, there were quite a few IPOs at that point in time. But as soon as a game release got moved, you know, it hit the share price massively. There was a massive investment in, in, in uh, physical goods. It tied up a lot of cash. Publishers are in a completely different position today. But what it, it took a long time to re-educate the market. And the market, to give them the credit, has spent a lot of time educating themselves. So you've got to thank businesses like Keywords, like Frontier, Team 17, and to some degree Sumo, because we've spent a lot of time with a lot of analysts and, and, and investors educating them on, on the video game space and how it now operates. And because it's been de-risked significantly away from physical goods and it's no longer cyclical with, with the console, you know, so you're not waiting for that, that installed penetration base to, 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 to reenact before all the third party publishers switch on their investment. It's made a big difference to, to how predictable the sales and, and market can be. And that's ultimately what, what analysts look for is a level of predictability. And it can now get that from the video game space. It's just a shame that some of the businesses that, that we had, like Gremlin, like IDOS, you know, back in the day, didn't get the same level of support in the UK, I think, that, that publishers got in the US. Otherwise, they might have still been around today. Um, but it, it was quite a tough market then. You know, one miss on a quarter, share price collapsed and, and you moved on. It was very different because of the investment in physical goods. It, today, the, the video game space, the industry's matured and the way products are delivered has changed beyond recognition. Yeah, and uh, it's not quite the same thing, but as you said, like, you know, if you had a, a failure in one quarter, like, you know, back in the day, like games had to succeed when they came out. Now there is a much longer tail. Games can... Okay. You know, they can be evolved, they can adapt, they can update. Um, and I, you know, Debbie on that, wasn't there at one point, where she was talking about Worms still, one of the original Worms games still selling from the yeah. mid-90s. You know, that's, yeah, still selling because it, it can do, because it's digital distribution. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. It's, Absolutely fantastic. It, it's a fascinating place, the industry now, like comparing it back to the 90s and, and 2000s. Um, uh, I could go on a tangent about that, but I, I, I shan't. I'll, I'll get us back on track. Back on track. Um, but looking at IPOs, then, like what has amazed me, particularly over the last year, is the the range of size of company that have gone um, that, have, that have that have gone public. You know, you have these much much larger organisations like Unity, and then you have smaller studios as well, or, or relatively smaller studios as well, have have gone public and, and floated. I guess I kind of. From your perspective, having having done this a year, years ago, like what what does a company need to do to prepare for? How does a company reach the stage where it's like, right, we can now consider and and do an IPO? What needs to happen first? Uh, again, it, it's about getting the right advisors. You do need to ensure you've got a lot of professional management systems in place. You know, in terms of how you report your accounts how are you managing your business, how you can report your business on a monthly basis. It's abs absolutely essential. So management systems are, are key in that respect. It is quite expensive to be on the market. You know, the, the, the amount of governance and burden on reporting comes with a level of expense. So you should accept that. And, and, and I think for some of the smaller people that currently listed, then it's quite a burden. I think we're, we're, when we floated at 145 million, I wouldn't have wanted to be any smaller than that because of the costs that we invested into doing things the right way on the market in terms of governance and expectation. So people should be aware of that. But at the same time, you shouldn't put people off. You know, aspire to, to, to do what you want to do, whether that be a trade sale, whether that be taking private money and do, doing it on the private side, because although debt doesn't work for sumo it, because of the style of business we are it might work in a different environment you know if you're if you're just all out on creating your own ip 
and you've got an investor that can help you support the debt in a different way, then that might be the way to go. But then, you know, if, if, you, if you feel that an RPO is the right way to go because you don't want to take on debt and you, you can take investment in a different way, then that's, you know, that's great. But, but be aware that, you know, you do relinquish a lot of, of, uh, of ownership at that point in time. So even though if you can retain a significant stake of the business, you're accountable to a lot of people. And, and ultimately, you know, some of those investors are pension funds and whatever, and you feel you've got a, a duty of care and responsibility to make sure you do deliver what you said you're going to deliver. Um, I want to cycle back to Sumo and how, it, how it's grown over the years. Um, you gave that head, updated headcount figure. Um, apologies, I pulled the 700 figure from your website. So I, I, I would suggest updating that perhaps. We, 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 I, I, was that on the Sumo Digital website or on the Sumo, Sumo Group? Digital. Yeah, so, so Sumo Digital was obviously one division we've got within Sumo Group now. So Right. Yeah. So, so this was where I was going to go. Like, cause I'm guessing that that, that thousand plus headcount is, um, is boosted obviously by the fact that, that Sumo is now not just one studio and hasn't been for a long time. It is Sumo group. And that yeah. group is expanding. Um, you've, ex- you've, you've mentioned the Chinese room, um, which obviously you acquired a few years back. Yeah. You've acquired uh, lab 42 red kite games, Pixland games. Um, and in an interview with uh, my colleague Chris, which you can read on GameCentry.biz, you mentioned like you're still kind of looking at more acquisitions. Um, what what is it? What is it you look for when you're trying when you're trying to grow the company, uh, or sorry, grow the group, and you're trying to bring more companies in? Like, what is it that you you look for? We've obviously got a strategic fit that we're looking for in terms of the style of a of, of business. And, and, and at the moment we're you know, considering three different options. First of all, carrying on to do the kind of bolt on acquisitions that help us accelerate one of our operating divisions, the red Kai, adding that into the Sumo digital family has been great. Uh, and adding the Chinese room into the Sumo digital family has been great. We acquired Pipeworks back in October last year, which is, quite a big developer over in the U S that's its own standalone operating division. And we'll be looking to, to acquire some smaller studios to help them accelerate through, through that bolt on acquisition piece as well. Um, in addition to that, we're looking at larger acquisitions around new operating divisions, which could be in new territories. You know, we've got no representation in Asia, for example, or it could be in Eastern Europe. And, and we're also looking at, at publishing opportunities. So we've kind of got three, three areas that, that we're focusing in on. But the most important, the most important thing we are looking to do is, is, is invest in management teams. And we're not, we're not interested in buying a business where people want to cash out and go because we don't want to take on responsibility for someone else's business. We want to work with teams that want to work with us because they believe, like us, that being part of something larger means we can accelerate ambition on both sides. So having a team that's really aligned in, with, that, with that mentality is extremely important. Then there's the culture. We, we want people that are like-minded and, and have a similar culture to the rest of the, the people in our business. Otherwise, it gets quite difficult. And, and, and I think culture is a really important aspect these days. You know, we want people, we're a business that treats the people right. We want business that respects their clients. So when you, when you kind of narrow it all down, you know, I guess we are, we, you know, for us, we, we feel that, that we're, we're fishing in, in a quite a small pond. We, we've consciously tried to ignore businesses that are in competitive processes because if you're in a competitive process, we feel that it becomes about the highest bidder. And for us, it's not just about being the highest bidder. It's about also offering a future and being part of a future is something that can help somebody accelerate their own ambition. When you're looking at um, acquiring a studio or bringing a studio into the fold, like what factors into, I'm hoping I'm, I'm remembering this right, that some acquisitions or mergers or, or just you know, add-ons have been other company studios that have then taken on the Sumo name. So I believe, and I'm really hoping I've got this right, Sumo Newcastle used to be CCP, Sumo Nottingham used to be Dambuster or Koch Media or something to do with no? Uh, no. So, so the, the, the only one there is the Newcastle one. So obviously we couldn't keep the CCP name. 
as, as much as I'd like to, Hilmar, uh, Hilmar wasn't going to let us keep the CCP now. <laughs> so, so, you know, for us, we, we talked to the studio. They wanted to be called Sumo, but we felt we at least had to differentiate in the location. So it, it was Newcastle. You know, it was, no more, it was no more creative than that, if you can call that creative. Sumo Nottingham was, was a day one, you know, organic growth. You know, we, we started that from scratch. Um, so that's why it was Sumo Nottingham. Uh, the same with Sumo Leamington, the same with Sumo Warrington. But where we've acquired a, a studio that's got a reputation of their own, with a strong, a strong reputation and a good brand like Red Kite, we've, we've kept that brand. The same with the Chinese Room and the same with Lab 42, which, you know, the guys have, are known for doing what they do very well. They, they execute very well. We're not, you know... We're not precious, that precious about the sumo name to believe it's better than anybody else's. <laughs> and, and, you know, Simon, Dan, Ed, they built great reputations around their own brands. So we wanted, to, we wanted them to keep that. That's their ownership. You know, make, why, why devalue their ownership in changing the name? Well, speaking of brands, you, uh, you have a new one in the works. Um, we wrote about this on Capture Your Business uh, recently as well. Um, we've recently launched the new Secret Mode Publishing Division. Yeah. Um, now, as I say, there's a full article about this on, on our site about you know, what the, the, the company aims to do. It's kind of a mix of internal IP, things like Snake Pass and Spider, um, but also potentially some third parties. Kind of in your own words then, like what's, what's the goal of this project? How did this come about? Well, as you know, we've, we've self-published uh, a couple of games in the past, you know, Snake Pass being one. We acquired Dear Esther when we acquired the Chinese Room. We've got uh, Prominence Poker when we acquired um, Pipeworks. And we knew Pipeworks was happening through the summer. We, we felt that we were getting to a point whereby we needed to treat publishing as its own entity with its own values and, and objectives. Whereas to date, to that point, it had been an extension of, of our development team's activity, which means that sometimes you're wearing two hats, and that's never a good thing. So, you know, we, we felt that we needed to have somebody solely responsible for publishing. And, and having known James for a long time um, and having a huge amount of respect for him, when James was, was, was available, we thought it'd be a great fit for Sumo. You know, again, it comes back to culture, belief on delivery, do exactly what you said you were going to do. James is that guy. So, so we, we felt that it was a good opportunity to start a publisher. We didn't mandate secret mode. James and Derek and, and, the, and the guys that we've now got on the publishing team created that, you know, from scratch. We wanted them to have ownership of what they're creating. And, and going forward, you know, they've obviously now got Prominence Poker. They've got Snake Pass to, to sell. They've got Dear Esther. They will have Spider and Little Orpheus when it comes out of its, when they come out of the exclusivity period with Apple. So they've got something to be going on with and, and keep them busy. But at the same time, you know, we want to help other indie developers as well get their products to market. Sumo has been approached quite a lot over the last three years to help developers bring products to market. And we're like, well, we can, but it's not what we do. It's not our expertise. So we're probably not the right home. So it's, it's not for us. But now having James and the team, you know, we, we feel we've got that opportunity. Uh, and, and that's something that, that we feel passionate about in terms of providing support. Really appreciate your time today. Um, I've taken up a bit more than I planned to. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with one last question, if I may. Um, as I say, we've kind of got a range of indie devs uh, in the audience. You may well have like another team of four founders with their team of 12 behind them, much like you were back in 2003. Um, any advice to any studio founders, startups um, who perhaps dream one day of becoming as big as Sumo? Is it, you know, like going from this this... Yeah. you know, pluck a young studio that can to becoming like one of the biggest developers in Britain. Keep going and don't be afraid to ask for help. I think one of the secrets of Sumo's success is having four founders. I can't imagine how difficult it is for a startup or an early stage development business to have one founder with all that responsibility. So get yourself some help if, if you're in that position. And if you're not in that position and you've got 
a team of people around you still ask for help from externals you learn a lot you'll progress quickly and and just keep going it is it's hard work but it's enjoyable carl thank you so much for your time today that's been really appreciated great thank you that is all we've got time for um, thank you very much for joining us thank you very much for tuning in for this session there's plenty more to come you can find a full schedule at live.gamesindustry.biz there's plenty happening on the special gamesindustry.live uh, discord server so head over to the site see what's happening head over to the discord meet some new people and uh, enjoy the rest of GI Live online thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>